I can share my screen. So, okay. Good afternoon. Thank you, Anarita, for this introduction. Um, I think everyone can see can see my screen now with a presentation on it. Um, I am Hilda Habermas. Yes, I <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm Hilda Habermas. I'm working for Nalian and I am within Nalian responsible for uh, the delivery of, uh, of the Clusters 2.0 pro project together with some, some other projects that I'm managing here. Um, I will give you a brief introduction today on uh, what the, how Clusters 2.0 has helped us to achieve um, some major, major milestones and I will guide you through the webinar. Anarita discussion. Um, Anarita, please don't. I can just hear some echo. Hello. I can't hear. Um, Okay. Is this better? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So I was I was telling you that um, I'm going to guide you through uh, through this webinar um, and will explain in the beginning how Cluster 2.0 has helped us all to achieve some, some major milestones uh, into this project. Um, after, after my presentation, um, Alex Driesen, my colleague, will give you an introduction on... Um, can I do this here? Yeah. Um, Alex will, will give his co-entrepreneur at Nalian and will give you an explanation how cargo cl clouds can support air cargo communities to operate as one. Um, he will show you also how technology and change management go hand in hand to facilitate collaboration and to increase visibility across the entire supply chain. Um, after the presentation of Alex, um, Sarah will, um, from Brussels Airport Community, uh, she's the Cargo Digital Development Manager at Brussels Airport uh, Company and she will dive into the specific example of Recloud, uh, the cargo community system of Brussels Airport and she will show you how slot booking enabled the, uh, them to, to build the community by providing um, a real operational problem, a solution to a real pro operational problem. She will support the community that supported the community to resolve such issues as um, triggering them to to initiate really some streamlining initiatives. Wow, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, after that, David will uh, Skatoria, who is working for Air Cargo Belgium, um, and as a consortium partner uh, participated also into the Clusters 2.0 project, will explain you how the association that is existing within Brussels Airport company um, to, uh, with the innovation of the community members. So, um, yes. Um, the Cluster 2.0 project is about facilitating the collaboration within logistics communities and the main target of the um, Cluster 2.0 project is to increase transparency and efficiency in the logistics supply chain and to re reduce costs and uh, improve the carbon footprint. Um, Cluster 2.0 has enabled us in testing in a real life environment how community community building can be facilitated and how collaboration can help us to realize targets that we put forward. Uh, during the course of the project, we, um, we have seen different types of communities. Um, on the one hand, we have uh, communities with their own, each with their own dynamics and all, each with a specific approach. We have seen communities that um, are not really centrally governed um, and where the approaches 
is, is in a specific way. Um, here on an airport community, we are in a very centralized environment where all different players are having already a kind of collaboration together. Um, and and whoa, today, oh, sorry. An airport is an, uh, and, and oops. today we will dive into the logistics communities that by nature have a centralized structure. Uh, an airport is such an, an example of such a logistics community. And five years ago, there were no airport communities that having such a community approach. Brussels Air Airport has been innovative and in advocating this to this collaboration approach and want together with us to increase the efficiency in collaboration. We see today more and more airport communities that start collaboration initiatives um, by introducing air cargo community systems. On the one hand, concrete use cases start evolving uh, at start to resolve a, a specific problem within the community uh, within the community. After the resolution of this specific issue within the community, the collaboration of the willing is having an approach and finding a solution to their problem. If they then see the, the advantages, these advantages have com can be communicated to the entire community and we see an increased efficiency and a reduction of costs. Other members of the community are joining nat naturally and they will enable the further collaboration identifying together new use cases and really working into a circular approach. The slot booking application is a cloud-based solution that is available through a, through a web browser and it's being extended with additional elements in the Landsite management suite. This will be later on elaborated by, uh, by Sarah van Gelder um, but it will allow the truck drivers to register their arrival and their departure by a simple mobile application. In the next short movie, we will show you how the application is being used in practice and, and can show you how the collaboration is really taking place by the different players. The, in the example we show here, the forwarder is booking a slot uh, into the system identifying there which freight he's going to bring or to pick up uh, at the ground handler at a specific point in time. The driver that is then going to collect the freight is able to see on his mobile app which is the freight that he, he has to come to pick up and what time he has to present himself at the counter. When he's at the counter, the ground handler staff can then really register automatically when he is, uh, what he's coming to coming for and what he's coming to pick up. He really is having also a touchless process in place to collect his freight, indicate what's missing, indicate also what's the damages that he's seeing. And together with someone of the ground handlers, they confirm then what he has been performing and really is, is ready for driving off again. All people involved in the process. So the forwarder at his desk, the truck driver himself and also the ground handler uh, at the desk or within the warehouse, these people can all see what's the status of the slot, also see what's going to be picked up, what has been done already and where the truck driver is going to. So, um, within the project itself, um, the slot booking solution based on the Nalian data sharing platform has been tested as part of the Living Lab 2. Um, so within the Living Lab 2, we have been testing really if the system was working, how the system could be used in, in, in practice, and also what's the improvements that had to be brought into the system by really practical use of, of the system. Um, these first collaborations really enabled also the community to start working together and really Fast after this first applications, uh, other participants within the community of Brussels Airport joined also to, to, add, to, uh, to, to add themselves into this application. Um, after this first use in Brussels Airport, the slot booking app has evolved into the core of the Landsite Management Suite 
and is really um, building layer after layer and functionality after functionality to further digitize the entire process at Brussels Airport. Um, what we also wanted to test during this Living Lab 2 uh, activities is to see if this process which is working in Brussels and which proved to be working in Brussels, uh, Davide will show you after this uh, also some, some performance and some KPIs that we have realized. We wanted to test also if this uh, success could be repeated in other airport communities. So we have conducted testing activities in London Heathrow and in Liège Airport. Um, the results from these tests confirmed that the approach was successful. Um, in Heathrow, we identified, however, that it was linked very closely linked to an infrastructural issue that needs to be resolved to get full uh, benefit of the solution being put in place. On the other hand, we will see later on also in the presentation of Alex that at Liège Airport, they reported similar benefits of um, the use of the slot booking application as which were detected in Brussels. Um, then going beyond clusters to dot zero, uh, we are now at a stage where this, uh, this solution is really being put into the market. Um, the product suite will be further marketed in other airport clusters and we see a number of airports uh, within Europe that are being interested or that are, have started already uh, the collaboration with us to, to implement this solution. But beyond this, we also see that there is communities already, one community uh, in, in Asia and, uh, and in the US that all uh, have also signed up to start implementing the solution. So this is really a proven solution that's accepted within um, the market and that's being accepted also among a number of other players that, that want to implement this. I now give the word to Alex, who can introduce you um, on Cargo Clouds and how they can enable collaboration. Okay. Don't hear you, Alex. Thank you. Here I am. So now you can hear me? I can hear you. Super. So thank you, Hilda. Uh, my contribution today will focus on demystifying airport cargo clouds. What is the value, but also what are some of the challenges in getting to that value? And to kick that off, I'd like to start with a story. So 10 years ago, if you would have walked around Brook Cargo, which is the cargo area of Brussels Airport, this would have been the dominating sentiment that you would find, a sentiment of being totally defeated. DHL had just moved their EMEA hub to Leipzig, the fallout of Lehman Brothers was still being heavily felt, and as good as every cargo actor on the airport hated the airport authority thoroughly. So, and when Brussels was described in the press, it's in Dutch here, I'm sorry, it was called the loser, the failure of Europe. So how low can you go? Six years later, if Brucargo came in the press, it was because they had won awards across the globe for their innovation, for their performance, for their vision. So what changed? Actually a lot, not least the mindset. The mindset has shifted totally from being an airport that also happens to do cargo to being a high performance logistic hub that also happens to be an airport. And a key part of that transformation meant putting in place the digital infrastructure to enable that performance. When Stephen Palmas, the new head of Cargo at the time, arrived, he quickly realized that each of the companies was quite well optimized within their own four walls because it was operated under one set of systems. But then they all go outside of the four walls and they all stand in the queue together. Clearly, a level of intercompany coordination was uh, missing. So Brussels provided a data sharing platform and a set of collaborative applications so that the whole community could operate not in silos, but united as one. The data sharing platform makes it safe and easy to share the data and the collaborative applications solve issues that no single stakeholder can solve on its own. And together, this delivered efficiencies and visibility for every stakeholder. And together, this delivered lots of data for the airport, which means smarter decisions and super effective marketing. 
And as a consequence, the airport as a logistic hub became much more attractive for all stakeholders, leading to further growth. So that's what they did. They called it Brook Louds. They connected all the stakeholders, and the rest is uh, history. Slot booking, which is the point of uh, the topic here in the context of clusters, is just one of the applications. In the meantime, this uh, example has served as inspirations for many other forward-looking airports around the globe, in the meantime on three continents, as Hilda already mentioned. And the interesting thing is that each of these airports started with a different motivation. Some started from a very specific pain point, like congestion uh, landside. Others started from this grand vision of possibilities. But in the end, they all went the same, improve the performance of cargo. So this is the situation today. By the end of next year, the map should look something like this. Also, the suite of applications has been extended significantly. Some of these applications come from us, from Nalian. Uh, others come from third parties, which fits perfectly well in our philosophy of being open, open to uh, third party applications, open to a connected uh, world. We call this a cargo performance cloud instead of a cargo community system. Why? Because that's in a sense what it is, a cloud to improve the performance of cargo. Now, I hear some of you thawing, asking, is this really new? Obviously, collaboration is not really new. If you look at the different stakeholders that make up a network in an airport, they have been collaborating already for quite a while. They have achieved this by sending each other messages, which is fine, but it has its limits because each actor needs to maintain a representation of reality and every actor needs to implement very similar business logic. These representations are often uh, incomplete and out of sync and the business logic is not always well tuned to each other. So we thought, Let's do this better. Let's suck in all the messages that flow already today and use these messages to maintain one single version of the truth. And once we have such layer, which represents the state of cargo, we can use the data to enable applications that focus on optimizing the processes that run between any two actors. And on the fly, these applications generate even more data to enrich, to further enrich the picture. So everybody benefits and the airport gets a massive amount of data uh, actionable data that can be used to drive business development or to drive investments to improve performance even more. If all of this sounds a little bit fuzzy, let me take a sports analogy. Without such a system for each of the players, it's a little bit like playing soccer in the fog. You don't see your co-players, you don't see your adversaries, you hardly see where the goal is. Suddenly the ball lands with you out of the blue. You kick it more or less in the direction of the goal, but you're never, never quite sure. And I guess this is fine if you're competing against parties that also don't have the visibility, but if you're competing against parties with perfect visibility, you can't win, you're just screwed. With such a system, it's more like a relay race where a fragmented set of players can be virtually integrated and together actually outperform any single integrated player as the four times 100 relay race proves. If we look at the stakeholders, they're all super excited about the results. The forwarders, they're happy because their trucks don't have to wait anymore. The handlers, they're happy because they get predictability on what will be coming so they can, so they can smoothen their resource planning much more. The airport is happy because cargo flows faster, because they need real, less real estate to accommodate uh, the same kind of, uh, kind of volume. So really, everybody wins. There are no losers unless maybe uh, competing airports. Uh, and those participants, they're so enthusiastic that they even are prepared to document why they are enthusiastic in all kinds of case studies, uh, where we have examples from, from the different uh, airports. Uh, one handler at Liège even commented that his productivity went up with 33%. Don't ask me exactly how he calculated that, because to me, it sounds like a little bit stretched, but hey, I'm not going to stop him in his, uh, in his comments. Um, so with all this kind of... Uh, super positive uh, news. The question becomes, if the outcomes are so positive, why are not all logistic hubs already running such a coordinating cloud? And the short answer is, it's not easy. It's bloody hard work to get there, as there are many hurdles. And to give you a flavor of such hurdles, allow me to briefly touch on what we call the zone of hesitation. So what is this? Well, it's slightly beyond the scope of this talk, but in general, we see increasingly strong drivers for all these kind of initiatives to move communities towards being virtually integrated in order to better compete with the fully integrated players, such as the Amazons or the Alibabas of this, uh, of this world. And when we discuss possibilities with new communities, very fast, everybody sees the logic and, and everybody says, go, go, go. 
But then when it's time for the individual companies to join, we see all kinds of hurdles popping up. And that's what we call the zone of hesitation. What kind of hurdles? I'll give you three examples. Um, first one is, can I really trust that my data is safe? Obviously, that's a legit, legitimate uh, concern. Uh, I'm not going to go as far as to say that it has to be Nalian insights to be on the safe side, uh, but don't try this with a couple of guys in a garage. And this really is tricky. If you have one data breach during the course of such a project, you can put your project in the fridge for the next five years. Nobody will want to engage uh, again. The second hurdle typically comes from people who have read that data is the new oil and who say that, yes, you can use my data, but you need to pay me for it. I need hard dollars or hard euros uh, for you to be able to use my, my data. And it takes a while to explain to these parties that the benefits come largely indirectly instead of directly by, from a monetary transaction. What do I mean with indirectly? If uh, Hilde is a supplier of mine, and by giving my data to Hilde, Hilde can do a better job, then I assume if market forces work in the right direction, that over time Hilde's pricing will uh, drop and I, and I will benefit. It's indirectly and it's a little bit delayed, um, but still it's a, it's a benefit. And it takes a, takes a while to explain that to all uh, the, the participants. A last example of such a hurdle, you probably all have heard about uh, something which is called technology adoption curves. If you look at each company or even each individual, we all have a tendency to be at the forefront of innovation or at the, or at the far end. Uh, some people, like Stephen Pullmans, for instance, he sees new technology, immediately sees the, the possibilities, and seeing the possibilities and having the potential for a competitive edge on his competitors is good enough for him to jump, even if there are still some uh, child diseases. Um, on the other end of the spe spectrum, you have people who only will jump on new technology and when if they don't jump, they get uh, they get killed. They really want to have seen everybody else uh, moving. Now that's perfectly fine as an individual company. Uh, if you're working in a community, it's a little bit trickier because there you might think that all participants in such a community need to jump at the, at the same time. Well, here the clue is to start with uh, small applications with a coalition of the willing, show the results, and once you have shown the results, automatically the rest uh, follows. That's what we have seen with slot booking in Brussels too, as uh, David or uh, Sarah might uh, testify uh, later on. So there are lots of hurdles like this. Some have to do with generic objections to change. A lot have to do with community dynamics, where people just want the others to go first, and, and they can follow when, when the risks are, uh, are gone. The message that I want to give with this um, is that there are a lot of hurdles and to get through this, it takes a conscious effort to build social trust in the community in addition to the technical trust coming from the platform. And that takes leadership, a leadership's role that, that may not be underestimated and that is often taken by the operator of the hub, in our case here, the, the airport authority. Absent such a party that takes on the leadership role and, and you give a, a bloody hard uh, uphill, uphill battle. Well, with that, I've said what I wanted to say, and I'd like to hand it over to Sarah and David to look at a very specific implementation, the pioneering Brook Cloud. So now I have to see how I stop sharing my screen voila, and change presenter to Sarah. You hear me now? Perfect. Good yes, afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Alex. Um, as I was already introduced by Hilda, I'm Sarah, working for Brussels Airport. Uh, and within the airport, I'm responsible for digitization uh, in the cargo team. Uh, and I'm going to present you how uh, we started with our cargo community initiative named Brucloud. Um, and where slot booking app specifically within this cluster uh, 2.0 project is part of uh, was creating a lot of advantages within our community. One second. Yeah. Okay. So first a short introduction. What is Brucloud? And then we will zoom in uh, starting from slot booking and how this ended into a whole land site management suite of applications uh, optimizing the whole land site management process in Brussels. So what is Brucloud? If you look to different stakeholders who are involved 
in getting a an air cargo shipment from origin to destination, we see that a lot of different stakeholders are involved. And this is exactly how they exchange data today. So they often exchange data in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, way. Um, on paper, uh, attachments to emails, but often data sharing is lacking, uh, which results in a lot of inefficiencies, errors, and no visibility. All of these companies uh, try to optimize their processes, but when you only inform the next stakeholder in line who needs to handle your shipment at the moment you're at his door, it's very hard for stakeholders to optimize the process from a helicopter view. So this was exactly the um, problem which was stated by the cargo team here in Brussels a couple of years ago that we needed digital collaboration between our different community stakeholders. So we came up with the idea of launching a data platform, which we named BruCloud, where actually each of the stakeholders could create a digital representation uh, of his company, a kind of digital avatar, uh, where they, as the source of data, decide what is shared with whom and in which context. Um, of course, this idea sounds very good, but then you're um, launching this in a competitive environment uh, where many different stakeholders are uh, fighting for pennies um, in the logistics industry, uh, where they say, OK, but when I share my data, what's in it for me? Um, so they want to get a, a quick return uh, in terms of operational efficiency gains, uh, in terms of uh, quality improvements. So uh, just data sharing for the aim of data sharing will not exist. So we need to find those issues which can only be tackled from a community perspective. And we started to develop applications where slot booking application was one of these apps where community collaboration solves a problem for everyone who is participating in this. We saw a lot of issues on, for example, Friday evenings and Monday mornings when everyone wanted to drop off or pick up uh, shipments at the ground handling agents. The ground handling agents are the one loading and unloading the aircraft and building the pallets uh, to load and unload, which means that they actually form a kind of bottleneck where all air cargo shipments need to pass through. So you can imagine on a Friday evening when everyone wants to drop off their shipments because they want to close off before the weekend, that all of those forwarders and trucking companies just started to show up around the same time, which created huge waiting times, inefficiencies, uh, but also an environmental impact, which cannot be, um, which cannot be ignored. Um, so this was one of the examples of an application that could be developed on top of the data sharing layer, where Alex uh, told you more about, uh, that could solve an issue and could be a reason for uh, what some of these companies would try to, uh, would want to share data about their operations. So uh, BruCloud is the name we use for the usage of the data sharing platform and the different uh, collaborative applications. And the BruCloud team uh, is actually a combination of different companies being Brussels Airport, Nalian, and also Air Cargo Belgium, where uh, David will tell more about later on. Uh, and of course, also all stakeholders and customers here at our cargo zone in Brussels. Um, so BruCloud is the open data sharing platform with multiple collaborative apps, which enable our BruCargo community to work more integrated and act as a network. We use a secure data sharing of Nalian, and we have put it, uh, our flag somewhere. We have an end goal to make it a full land site management paperless and efficient, but the exact way we're going to that fully paperless and efficient land site management is still very agile and flexible. So we uh, rely on the input from our cargo community, being the different stakeholders, being those ground handling agents, being those trucking companies who give us input on what should be the next application on our digital roadmap, or what is the biggest problem, which is very high on their priority list. Um, so with having these input from the cargo communities, we actually developed a whole um, digital roadmap with different applications uh, that are rolled out step by step. Um, the main focus is to integrate and not replace. We are not building in-house warehouse management systems, but we are solving with the applications those issues where collaboration between the different stakeholders is necessary. We as an airport, uh, we invest in the development of those applications to take away the complexity and the investment cost from the different stakeholders. 
Um, and the end goal is, of course, to offer a smart logistical solution for our local cargo community. But the reason that we share this as well with other cargo communities, and Hilda already referred to it and Alex as well, that other uh, communities start using some of the apps which were launched here in Brussels, is of course because the long-term focus is a fully connected data backbone or the cloud of clouds where many of these co communities can be connected because the end customer of Air Cargo in the end is looking for end-to-end -end transparency and a smooth process from origin to destination, not only at the origin or at the destination, for example. Um, the image you see here is what we call our digital roadmap, the BrueCloud Beehive. Uh, you see different colored logos. The colored logos represent applications which are live today or in pilot, so which are being used here within our cargo community. And today we will zoom in a bit more on all the green apps that focus on the land site management. Slot booking application is the central logo you see here, um, where many different applications are built around. Uh, already in the meanwhile, but you also see that there are still a lot of grey hexagons and they represent application IDs or innovation IDs popping up from out of our community. So we have um, a lot of companies being very involved in building together with us on this roadmap. Um, so the land site management suite, the green suite of applications, um, how did we start with this? So we identified the key pains within our community and those waiting times on Friday evenings and Monday mornings, as I refer to, were one of these key pains which could not be solved out of the individual perspective of one stakeholder. So we started to identify how this problem could be tackled. We started with the development and rollout of an application, being slot booking app, and turned that pain into a game. Based on these first steps, we developed a digital vision together with our community, which now resulted in this land site management suite of applications. So why slot booking application? Uh, to smoothen the process of freight delivery and pickup at the ground handlers facilities, eliminate waiting times for the trucking companies and the freight forwarders, especially during peaks, but also to fill up idle times and to get a smoother planning, uh, which can then optimize the personnel planning at the ground center site so they know better when they need to reserve how much gates and how many personnel um, to make sure that uh, everyone can be served. We uh, selected a central community approach because you don't want all of your warehouses to have a different way of slot reservation. Uh, so a central community ap approach is essential there uh, that everyone can just log on in the web application, as was shown by Hilde. Uh, they can select at which building and at which ground handler they want to pick up or drop off cargo, and they can book a time slot in exactly the same way for all different locations. Uh, what's also an added value is, of course, the transparency which you create because you collect a lot of operational data and David will so, uh, show some of the results uh, of this data follow-up within our cargo community. So uh, we have two main roles within slot booking, being a booker of slots and a supplier of slots. Um, you can request a single or a recurrent time slot and, as I mentioned, via exactly the same web app for all locations and handlers. The ground handler at the other side can make time slots available for different cargo types uh, within the opening hours that he wants to make them available. And the app looks for the automatic match between supply of a slot and the demand of a slot. Uh, main advantages, I mentioned them already for the booker being the freight forwarder or the trucking company, eliminating waiting times, also facilitating your booking process. There's one single view where you can follow up where you have booked the slot at what time, uh, and also, if the slot was started correctly, if your driver showed up on time, you can extract your statistics, uh, so you can get insight in your performance. The ground handler at the other side, so the supplier of slots, he can update his personnel planning and eliminate those peaks and fill up the idle times, and can also extract um, data about the performance. And then the control towers, that's a role that here in Brussels, uh, we as the airport, but at this time mainly the airport uh, community, being Air Cargo Belgium, uh, takes up, um, they can get insight in the occupancy of our cargo area, can identify uh, gaps in the land site management to identify future project uh, opportunities and application opportunities, but they also follow up the performance per stakeholder, uh, which uh, David will zoom into a bit more. So when we started with slot booking in 2018, you see that the dark gray boxes in this high level representation of the land site management process represent where um, these steps were digitalized uh, using one of the BrueCloud applications. 
So uh, it was possible to request a slot. After some iterations, this would turn into an approved slot. We also had a central driver database where all secured drivers uh, could be registered and for the companies they are working. So a company could link a specific driver to a slot. The moment he showed up at a handler, his actual time of arrival was registered. Um, and the moment he left, his actual time of departure was registered. So you see that there were still some gaps within the land site management that could be digitalized. So if we look to how the land site management suite looks today, uh, and what the commitment is for the beginning of 2021, you see that this will look completely different. Uh, in the meanwhile, it's not only possible to request a slot starting from slot booking, but also trucking companies can request this automatically from their um, plan uh, planning system, so their uh, TMS, um, their um, transport management system. Uh, and there will also be created a possibility later on this year where a slot can be re requested from a kind of uh, mobile application uh, a digital desk, as we call it, the moment that a driver who is not known in the system just shows up at a handler, that he still is um, pulled through a kind of registration process where he then can request an ad hoc slot. So you see that there are different possibilities to request a slot uh, and the scope is broadened from the traditional uh, slot booking application. In the meanwhile, you could also see it in the um, movie that Hilda showed. It's also possible to link your master airway bills, your freight details, so which shipments you will pick up or uh, drop off, which also creates the possibility to work more proactively. Um, the ground tender can prepare your shipments at the gate, which was reserved for you. Um, it's also possible to share your, uh, your estimated time of arrival sorry, during your drive to Brucargo, if you're originating from a, another airport, for example, which is a couple of hours driving away uh, and where traffic, uh, the traffic situation can have a big impact, there it's possible to share your estimated time of arrival and also rebook your slot automatically. Uh, once you arrive at the ground handler, uh, there are multiple options possible to register your actual time of arrival. This can be done via the mobile app, as you saw in the movie of Hilde, uh, but also via the digital desk app that will be uh, developed where you can then register yourself. I have booked a slot in advance or where you can start a registration pro process if you did not do that in advance. And this will help us as a community to push towards 100% of slot registration which will really create the added value um, of planning all of your gates for the grant handling agent via um, these different applications. In the mobile app for the driver, uh, you saw it also in the movie that Hilda showed, you can register your actual time of loading or unloading by scanning the QR codes at the gate, and you can register the handover of your shipment, missing pieces, damages uh, directly in this mobile app. Um, and at, when your slot is finished, you also close off the slot um, so by registering all these timestamps, it's easy to compare the planned slots with the uh, real life slots and see if there are any uh, corrections necessary, for example, if stakeholders book slots too long, too short, etc. Um, so you see that slot booking app was really a start for us as a community uh, to move towards a fully digitalized land site management, um, where in the meanwhile, this triggered a lot of new application IDs. Um, based on conversations we had with the users here in Brussels. Um, and I will now hand uh, the presentation to David. There you go. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, can everybody hear me and see my screen? Yes, I can. Ah, perfect. Thank you for the confirmation. Uh, so after the already interesting presentations of my colleagues, uh, I have the difficult job to close this uh, webinar. Uh, often the difficult task, but I will keep this presentation as interesting as possible. So my name is David Skatorkia. I work for Air Cargo Belgium. And Air Cargo Belgium is a community organization operating at uh, Brussels uh, Airport Cargo. And because I'm working for a community organization and because community or collaborating uh, 
collaborating as communities is one of the parts also in the cluster 2.0 project i want to zoom a bit in on that one the importance of community building how did we make this community at Brew Cargo? How did we make this work? And how are we, Air Cargo Belgium, working together with the community? And after that, I will zoom in on the salt booking app timeline, on the salt booking app results, and share with you some uh, some lessons learned during the um, during our timeline. But first, let's focus on the importance of community building. Uh, both Sarah and Alex already mentioned okay, it a bit. Sorry? I can't hear you. I think I lost you. I'm not sure if I'm the only one. Alex, can you still hear Good. me and no. see my screen? I can hear and see you perfectly. Good, very well. Okay, maybe it's just a connection issue on your side, Anarita. Beep, but please go on. Okay. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, both Sarah and Alex already mentioned that uh, the air freight industry is a very scattered landscape. So we have all those individual companies like trucking agencies, freight forwarders, uh, airline cargo handlers, airlines, and they are all optimizing within their own facilities. Uh, and that works fine, but to take the next step, they have to collaborate. And they did collaborate, but very in, in a very inefficient way. Sarah mentioned it. There is one-on-one -on -one communication via email, telephone calls, and always some part of the data gets lost. So the collaboration they have looks a bit uh, like the sign you see on the right side of the screen. It looks a bit like a spaghetti diagram. And that might have worked for them in the 80s or in the 90s, but all of a sudden, something changed in the airline industry. The airline industry was targeted by some game changers like Amazon, Alibaba, some really uh, big companies who had a big impact on the air freight industry. And for uh, the individual companies like DHL, for example, in order to compete with these big companies, the way of working had to change. So they had to move away from that spaghetti diagram and they had to evolve to a uh, to a community uh, that every partner they work together uh, a part of a network because only if you're part of a bigger network and not operating as an individual you can compete with the amazons and the alababas of this world and that's what we try to do here in uh, in brussels create that network uh, and i already hear you think yes everybody knows that we need to work together, we need to collaborate as a team, and everyone needs to be part of a network. Network, But how are we doing it? It's not that easy. Uh, and in order to do that, three things are very important. Uh, the first thing is facilitate. Make it very easy for everyone to participate in this network, to be part of the community. Take away all thresholds and make it accessible, make this community accessible for everyone. If a small company wants to join, that's fine. If a multinational wants to join, he also needs to have the ability to be part of that network. So the, part the participation level or uh, to step in and to participate, that level needs to be really low. Everyone needs to be part of that network. The second thing, second important thing is communicate. Ask questions, share your inputs, lead by example, share your best practices. That's really important uh, because only if you communicate with each other, communicate your results, communicate your way of working, you can progress as a network, you can progress as a team and make that collaboration work. Uh, but the most important thing is, of course, the collaboration itself. We need to bring stakeholders together on a regular basis, not just once or twice a year, no, really on a monthly level, maybe even on a weekly level in the beginning, but that collaboration, bringing the stakeholders together is really important and not just uh, sit, have everyone sit in one room and one of the partners is doing a monologue. No, you have to interconnect with them in an, in, in an interactive way, uh, organize brainstorm sessions and stuff like that. Uh, so now you know what the three key points are of building in community, but there is still the question of who takes the leadership. You still have to have a partner that 
takes that ownership of building a community and a partner that everyone trusts. And in Brussels, that was Air Cargo Belgium, or that is still Air Cargo Belgium. So Air Cargo Belgium is the community organization that is operating here, and that is uh, operational since 2016. And Air Cargo Belgium is really that organization that represents all airline state or air and that, that represents all the stakeholders in the air freight industry, freight forwarders, trucking companies, airlines, all stakeholders. Uh, so in Brussels, we have that community organization by focusing on the three big points that I just discussed. But how does it now work? How does this community organization work at Brucargo? And that's also, also something I will tell you about. Uh, here in Brussels, we have a very specific way of working. First, uh, we have different kinds of steering groups. And steering groups, that is a group of people. Most of the time, it's like 10, 15 people that come together. All people coming from the community here and that uh, brainstorm about different topics. We have, an, uh, overall, we have like nine steering groups. Uh, I myself am part of the digitization steering group, just like Hilde and Sarah. And those 15 people in that steering group represent the entire community. So they brainstorm about ideas, the pain points about that, uh, about that topic and see what can we do to take that pain point away? How can we build a project around it that is beneficial, not just for the group here, that 10 to 15 people, but for the entire community? And as soon as they come up with a project ID, it is uh, brought back to the clusters. We have an airline cluster, a handling agent cluster, and a freight forwarder cluster. And while we have in the steering groups already a good representation of our community, in those clusters, we have the entire community. So that ID that was, uh, that existed or that was brought forward by that uh, 10 to 15 people will now be evaluated by the whole community. And if the whole community, if these clusters say, okay, that's a great idea, we build a project group around it. And that's also how we started with slot booking app. Sarah already said that uh, the ideas are coming from the community. So this is the way that we are working. This is the way how slot booking came alive in, uh, in Brussels. And during the timeline and during the uh, the whole project of slot booking, the whole slot booking app project, there was constant communication between the project group, the steering group, and the clusters to make sure that everyone was on the same line and updated about the project, and helped to steer the course of the project. Now. Uh, let's zoom in into slot booking then, the, uh, the project that we did in the Clusters 2.0 project here. I will not uh, repeat this slide because Sarah already mentioned it and the goals we try to achieve with slot booking and the results will come back uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, but to give you a, a sense of what slot booking app looks like, it was already in the movie of Hilde, but that was perhaps a bit quick. That's why I took a screenshot of how what the application looked like to give you really a sense of the application. So here you can see the booking screen. This is the screen that the freight forwarder has to fill in. In this screen, he can book the slot. So on top of the screen, you can see a set of parameters the freight forwarder has to fill out. For example, he has to tell at what ground handling agent he wants to pick up or deliver cargo. A booking time frame, the transport origin, is the, is the freight he is about to pick up or deliver, is it secure? What is uh, the cargo type? In this case, general cargo, but it can also be pharma or live animals, uh, perishables. So he has to make a decision here. Is it import or export freight? What kind of truck uh, will, I, will I be using? Is a ULD required? Uh, the airline, so he needs to set or he needs to fill out a set of parameters and based on that uh, set of parameters, he will see the capacity that the ground handling agent made available. Uh, in this case, you can see that the ground handling agent made six, uh, five, sorry, five time slots or five gates available for that set of parameters. 
and everything you can see here in white is still capacity that is available. Everything that is already grayed out is capacity that has already been taken to someone uh, by someone else. And this is a live screenshot of the slot booking application. So you can really see here that the application is used in Brussels and is used actually quite a lot because only or aside from slot five, the fifth port uh, at that particular ground handling agent, uh, most of the time slots are uh, are already occupied. And this is uh, not no not in this in this slide, but in the next one you will see it. Uh, but let's maybe focus first on this slide. This is the timeline of uh, our slot booking app project. We started or we went live in 2018, January 15 with five freight forwarders and two ground handling agents. And I mentioned specifically the, uh, the logo of WFS and DHL Global Forwarding, because both partners are also part of the Clusters 2.0 project. And they started uh, from the beginning with slot booking and their input was really important to us. They gave really good input and are really good users of the applications. Uh, and really helped us to take the next steps into the project. Uh, so we started with five freight forwarders, two ground handling agents, and then step by step, more people or more freight forwarders joined the project. At the end of 2019, 24 freight forwarders joined the application. And those 24 forwarders represented at that time about 80% of the cargo that was being handled at uh, uh, in Brussels. So that was actually quite a lot uh, already achieved in the first year. In the second year, because we already had 80% uh, of the freight covered, the, the increase in players was not as incremental as we had in the first year, but still some new players um, joined the project. And what was very good was actually the uh, the third ground handling agent that stepped into the project on February 21st. So we added a new ground handling agent, which means that another ground handling agent uh, offered the same way of slot capacity of slot booking as the other two that were at that moment operational. So at that point, all three ground handlers that were operational at Bricargo offered slot booking application. So the freight forwarder could use this application uh, for every pickup and every uh, drop, up, drop off at the ground handling agent. Uh, and towards the end of 2020, uh, another two freight forwarders joined. So uh, we landed in, 2000, uh, in the end of 2018 when 27 freight forwarders and three ground handling agents. Um, okay. In 2020 or late 2000, uh, 2019, a fourth ground handling agent went operational at Bricaro. And actually, as of tomorrow, that fourth ground handling agent will also use the slot booking application. So as of then, again, uh, all ground handling agents that are operating at Bricaro are then offering slot booking applications. So that's uh, really something we are glad about in, in our community that everyone of the freight uh, of the ground handling agent is using this application. If we then look at the slots that are booked over time, you already saw it a bit in the screenshot that uh, slot booking app is an application that is really used in our community. And here you can see the slots that are booked by our community over the entire timeline. So starting in 2018 up to uh, May 2020. I don't have the results for June yet. Uh, I will collect them uh, tomorrow. Uh, and as you can see here, we started in the beginning uh, with 430 slots booked, but as more players joined the project, of course, more slots were being booked. And after a half year into the project, already more than a thousand slots uh, per month were booked by our community. So that's that's already quite a lot. And we see some fluctuations uh, in that first year. There are different reasons. Towards the end of the year, it's a bit busier. So uh, more slots are being booked beginning of the next year's slots drop a bit because that busy period is over. But you can see a really big increase in uh, January, February of 2019. 
and that's if we go back to the timeline that's the part or that's the uh, the timing when the third ground handling agents joined the project so then slots really went up and as of then we stayed uh, a bit yeah uh, around that 2500 number for quite some time we had a peak uh, almost going up to 3000 and dropped a bit uh, again in the beginning of uh, this year to 2200 and unfortunately because of the COVID-19 crisis there are less flights uh, departing from Brussels or taking off from Brussels so we see the impact on slot booking as well so the slot booking uh, the slots that are booked is a bit less than than what it was at the end of last year but still around 2000 slots each month and if we compare it, or if we look at the number of people involved in slot booking, those 27 freight forwards, those 2,000 slots, it, you can actually say that uh, every partner books around, on average, uh, two slots a day, which is not, not that bad. So actually really good. <laughs> Uh, zooming in on the goals we tried to achieve with slot booking. The first one was the reduction of the waiting times for the freight forwarders. The second one was a cost reduction in the air cargo supply chain. And the third one was increase in efficiency performance of the quant handling agents. And I will go uh, step by step through these, uh, through these goals. Let's zoom in on the first one. Reduction of the waiting times for the freight forwarder. And actually, before slot booking application and before the other applications that uh, Sarah mentioned and uh, the people of Nalion mentioned that are in the landside management suite, we didn't have a tool or the freight forwarders did not have a tool to uh, register their waiting time at the ground handling agent. They didn't keep track of it. So our baseline was actually established by doing a survey at the freight forwarders. Luckily, most freight forwarders all said the same thing that their average waiting time for a drop off or pickup of cargo was around 45 minutes to 60 minutes, which is quite a lot. Slot booking app, with slot booking app, we want, of course, to eliminate or decrease those waiting times. And now, because of slot booking app and the features and the applications built around slot booking app, we have an objective way to measure the waiting times. And we did that. Uh, through uh, the course of the project and I have here presented or calculated the waiting times uh, for 2020 and we see a big increase in the waiting or a big decrease sorry a big decrease in the waiting time and uh, in 50 uh, in 65 uh, percent of the cases the waiting time dropped to zero minutes up to 15 minutes in 26%, the waiting for the freight forward has been between 15 minutes and 30 minutes. And only in 9% of the cases, uh, they have a waiting time of more than 30 minutes. So that's quite a, a decrease that we established by the introduction of slot booking app. So we're really proud of that, that slot booking app could take away the waiting times of the freight forward, because that was one of the biggest goals that we want to achieve because that was one of the biggest bottlenecks especially in those peak moments on a friday evening or on a monday morning uh, and then that second goal that we had that was cost reduction in the air cargo supply chain this one is actually really closely related to uh, to the waiting times because of course waiting time for a freight forwarder that means also a cost because where the waiting time uh, costs are uh, uh, yeah, you have a cost if there is a waiting time. And how did we measure the reduction in waiting time? Uh, we based ourselves on a study of the uh, Flemish Institute for Logistics in, in Belgium. They did a study and uh, calculated that one minute of waiting time equals one euro uh, cost savings for a company. So if we look at the first graphs on top of the screen, the waiting time decreased. It went from 45 minutes to 60 minutes, up to, in the majority of the cases, less than 15 minutes. We see a reduction in the waiting time of an half an hour up to uh, 45 minutes. So if we uh, calculate that in euros, we see that there is a cost reduction of 30 euros up to 45 uh, euros per, 
slot pickup or per slot delivery or per slot delivery so that's also a quite quite uh, saving for the freight forwarder so the more slots they're booked the less waiting times they're uh, they're having and the more costs uh, they're saving so also that second goal was uh, established and then the last one an increase in efficiency uh, performance of the ground handling agent here we based ourselves on the experience of uh, the ground handling agents in the project and uh, WFS in particular because they are a partner in the cluster 2.0 uh, project as well and there Marie Klaassen who is uh, director of of WFS told us that the uh, efficiency uh, in their performance increased up to 10 percent because of slot booking application and there is evil potential to further increase so we're really proud with this result that uh, because of slot booking application the performance of the handlers is uh, is much better and because of slot booking application they can really plan their uh, personnel better and have them achieve or have them work in a better way and then to conclude my presentations, I want to tell you a bit about the lessons we have learned uh, throughout the project, not only for slot booking, but also for community building, because that's also not uh, always the most easy job. If we look at community building, uh, the first thing we have learned, and it's also the most important one, is that trust is key. There needs to be trust between the different partners in the community. Otherwise, if there is no trust, they will not be able to collaborate together. They will share some information, but definitely not all information. Uh, we have to create a common benefit in the community or in uh, for the stakeholders, not focus on a project or something that is beneficial for a group of partners or for one individual partners. No, we have to look at the bigger picture. We have to look at a benefit for everyone. And uh, give people a voice. We need to hear the people in our community. We need to hear what is going on, what the issues are. It's not Air Cargo Belgium. It's not the airport who is uh, saying, OK, this project are we doing? No, it's really the community who is giving us the input, who tells us what the problems are they are facing on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. And based on that, on those issues, we can start a project. And then as the community organization itself, we need to be visible, we need to be very approachable because otherwise people are not coming to us and they uh, keep working uh, within their own organization and try to optimize their own processes and don't think about the big picture. And then to conclude the lessons learned for slot booking application, uh, yeah, we see that the good cooperation between the different partners is very crucial. Uh, a strong community helps the project to move forward. Uh, uh, a mind change takes time, and that's something we learned the, the very hard way, actually, because slot booking a project is not a project that you introduce or that we introduced in 2018 and we could just let it go. No, it requires constant follow up from, uh, from our sites if something went wrong, if uh, the results were not that good. We had to intervene. We had to talk to the partners, uh, set everyone straight again, get them back on the same line. So a mind change in the community, that's uh, that's something we, we learned the hard way. And then continuous monitoring is necessary in order to make sure partners respect the made agreements. That's something I just mentioned already. When a partner uh, is making abuse of the system, is not respecting, uh, the, the guidelines or the agreements we made in the beginning, uh, we have as a community operator uh, the obligation to intervene. And uh, so those were our lessons learned. And this actually concludes my presentation uh, for Air Cargo Belgium and uh, yeah, what we have done in the Clusters 2.0 project. So thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Alex. Um, I think we can now go to the question and answers. Uh, so if there's anyone who's having any questions, please don't hesitate to, to ask. 
And and perhaps um, I have one one question already for Sarah. Um, we saw in the presentation of David that uh, the number of slots um, have been dropping uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, impact. Um, how would you say that uh, the digitization and the uh, digitization projects are being impacted by, by COVID-19 in general? Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Uh, I think in general, um, that we can definitely conclude that everything uh, working on digitization and innovation uh, within our industry actually only gained more um, attention. Uh, so we can definitely see that companies do realize now even more than before that if they want to survive on the long term, that having um, digitally supported or digitally enabled processes is key. Uh, we can definitely say that some of our applications uh, created even uh, added values which were not foreseen in the beginning. Uh, for example, they made it possible to respect the social distancing rules in a better way. Um, so there we can clearly see that there were some extra added values which we did not uh, plan in the beginning. Uh, of course, uh, the drop in slots is directly linked to the drop in volume uh, we have seen over the past months also uh, because some um, very big shipments uh, were planned at this moment, where before uh, we have a very scattered landscape where small and uh, medium sized forwarders as well uh, need to deliver freight. We're now uh, during this. Um... Anna, did I think you're typing? Yeah, we have some background noise there, sorry. Um, so uh, now that uh, during this uh, crisis, we see that uh, a lot of big forwarders, for example, um, are doing, yeah. A lot of larger shipments uh, or specific charters which are fully chartered to uh, shipments for a specific destination where we don't necessarily always see a direct drop in kilograms but in amount of deliveries that is needed to fill up those kilograms uh, so that's directly linked to mm -hmm. uh, to the amount of slots we need of course uh, but I can talk and, and David will, will support it probably. Uh, we have a digitization steering committee. We have a lot of working groups on applications which will be rolled out in the next months. Uh, and I think over the past months and weeks, uh, there was a very small delay because some people were just put on temporarily on the unemployment and we need to shift with some responsibilities in companies. But actually we could keep our pace up with all the digitization projects uh, as planned, more or less, uh, and we are very happy about that. For example, next week uh, we launched the pilot of our road feeder management app, so the application where the actual um, estimated time of arrival of truck drivers on their way to Brussels will be shared, um, and it's a project where a lot of input from different stakeholders and from our cargo community was necessary, uh, so that was definitely not uh, COVID was not a reason to stop uh, the digitization track, but rather to stimulate it more and to open the eyes towards more advantages for those who were not yet on board. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, any, any questions from the public there? Uh, perhaps uh, another question. Um, how would we describe the what what would we say that's the biggest challenge uh, that that we had to start with this um, both I think uh, to Alex and, and Sarah and and, and the, David probably uh, on the technology side and on the and on the uh, uh, change management side getting the community rolling and getting everything running what was the biggest challenge that we have encountered there from a community side that uh, it was already uh, mentioned in my presentation, I think that that mind change, people at the, uh, at the cargo industry here in Brussels were used of doing a certain process for 20 years, 50 years, and all of a sudden we came up with a solution that we allowed them to work in a digital way, something that they were not used to, everything was paper-based, so that new way of working uh, was something that uh, yeah we felt a bit not I, I want to say a bit of resistance but that's not that's not the the exact word uh, there was a coalition of the willing of course but uh, to get a broader community on board more people on board 
who were working for so long in a very specific way that was that was really challenging for us as a community organization convinced everyone to get on board and we see or what we see as air cargo belgium those people it was highlighted in alex's presentation as well you have the early adopters but you have the late majority and that late majority will join but only when they see the benefits uh, of uh, with one of their uh, competitors. Mm -hmm. So that was for Air Cargo Belgium one of the uh, biggest challenges. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with what you are saying, David. It's like people have certain habits in how they organize their operations, and to change them, um, it's it takes it takes an effort. Uh, what we of course see is that. Uh, as David also mentioned, when we started with five forwarders um, in the pilot of slot booking application, we got the attention of a lot of other forwarders because the drivers of those other companies saw that the ones who were using slot booking had an advantage when they showed up at the ground handling agent because they got a priority, a kind of green lane service, which the other ones did not get. And I still feel that that should be the main um, incentive for stakeholders to join. Uh, that's also the reason that we will start later this year with the digital desk application, where we will pull everyone through a registration process at the handler. Uh, and there uh, it will be possible for us to identify those stakeholders who are now not yet on board because you have those, yeah, the big group of forwarders who count for 80 to 90% of the volume, they are in our network, they are involved in the working groups of Air Cargo Belgium, and we can get access to them. But the, the smaller part um, of the community who are not very engaged and who are yeah, maybe not very out there, uh, it's important that we get them on board as well, because uh, some part of the advantages uh, will be reached only when everyone is on board. Um, at this moment, we're still in a hybrid situation where some of the gates are managed via slot booking and another part is managed in the old way because not everyone is on board yet. And that's definitely something uh, the new application will overcome and will help us to push it forward. Mm -hmm. um, Alex, could you pro probably uh, tell us something more on what you have seen changing over the last time, uh, last years in, in air cargo communities uh, in general over the world and how they adopt digitization. We don't hear you. Alex, we don't hear you. <laughs> now you should. And first I'd like to add something on the previous question uh, because your, your question was what were the biggest challenges, uh, both technological as uh, as from an adoption perspective or a change management perspective. As compared to the social challenges, uh, the technology challenges are peanuts. They have been solved already for a very long term, very long time, so that, that's not an issue anymore. And then if you, if you have to go back, like what were these challenges? Well, we already mentioned uh, that at the, at the beginning as one of the hurdles. To set up a system where it is super easy to make sure that uh, Every party can share just enough information, but not too much, and to, to keep that controllable and, and configurable. That was a well, little bit of a breakthrough uh, for uh, for Nalian to get that not uh, not cracked. And up till now, I haven't seen any other system across the globe who can do uh, who can do the uh, the same thing. Um, so, but that's already five years ago. So that's not a challenge uh, anymore. What you see changing in, in cargo communities is that uh, the concept of these of these systems, of the concept of cargo community systems, cargo cloud, this collaboration uh, becomes more and more acceptable across uh, communities across the globe. Uh, five years ago, when we were preaching this uh, to, to the world, it was as if we came from Mars. Like, what are you guys coming up with? And there's never in the world that we will be sharing our data in the same system as what our competitors are, are, are be using. And today, people look at it as if it's a given, as if these are things that there are, and it's not anymore about uh, the, the challenges and, and uh, the concept. It's more about what are the applications doing and how fast can I get it up, up and running? Uh, what kind of value can I get out of it as as as, as fast uh, as fast as possible? So the the conversation topic changed uh, changed completely from from should we be doing this or not or what are reasons to do this or what are reasons not to do it to what should we be doing first? Okay. 
Thank you very much. Um, is anyone willing to add something still as conclusion? I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, we are receiving some questions from the audience. So maybe some of the speakers will be willing to answer them. Um, I don't see any questions here in the... No, Anna Rita, I think you you need to uh, or send us the questions or read the questions out loud because otherwise we don't have access. Yeah. I can uh, read the questions aloud and then you decide who's the best speaker to address them or maybe you want to have a round of opinions. So, um, no stakeholders stopped recently due to financial reasons related to COVID-19. And then there's another question. Is it possible to expand this due to the wider logistics community that perhaps don't use air cargo? And then there's another one that, that's very interesting. So is the slot booking app a first come first serve? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of questions more I would like to share with you and then um, Maybe we can close this round of this uh, of questions and answers. How many companies in like more or less uh, talking about percentages are not using the app, or do you do all companies have to use the app? I think this one is related to the the, the wider uh, community in uh, through cargo, and how do you influence players? That don't want to join the platform. So this is okay. very interesting questions that we're receiving from our attendees. Who wants to answer them first? I will answer the part of uh, the the number of, of partners involved in slot booking app projects. It was already uh, in my presentation. So as of tomorrow, four grant handling agents are uh, involved in the projects, and that's all grant handling agents that are operational at Bricargo. Uh, so from the grant handling agents, we are covered as of tomorrow. From a freight forwarder perspective, uh, we have 27 freight forwarders on board. Of course, there are a lot of freight, a lot, a lot more freight forwarders in in the Brussels community, but those 27 represent about 50 and 85 till 90 percent of the freight that is being handled here. Uh, and the other freight forwarders, how do we get them on board? First of all, we try to reach out to them as a community organization, as Brussels Airport. Uh, to convince them that the project has or can have an added value for them. But more importantly, that's what Sarah just talked about, is that when they see their competitors using the application, when they see competitors uh, are being prioritized at the gate because they use slot booking application, they really come to us. They saying, hey, I've heard that you are doing something on an application in which I can book slots at a grant handling agent, what can I do or what uh, can my company do to join this project? So in the beginning, it was really us going to the community, but now because they see the application working in real life, they see that their competitors are getting an advantage, they now are coming more and more to us to join the project. I'd like to Sarah, you want to add to that? No, no, it's okay. I, I was just going to ask which uh, the other questions were again, uh, because okay. we we see, don't see an overview. So, yes, I'll I'll jump on uh, on one of the questions that I remembered. Like, is this transposable to? Uh, is this extendable? Obviously, yeah. Today we've been talking about uh, what this can do. This kind of cargo cloud or logistics collaboration cloud at, at, uh, at the level of uh, an airport and the cargo players at an airport. But the vision is to, to be able to track shipments end-to-end, uh, door-to-door, uh, uh, if you want. So that it's adding the other legs or the additional legs uh, to the change that we, are, that we are doing already right now. That's one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is like what with the other logistic uh, hubs. Well, with Nalian, I think in the meantime we've been uh, we've been helping maybe five types of, of logistic hubs. Some logistic hubs, as in geographically 
uh, hub, but also a more conceptual hub. And we were at the root of uh, the implementation of Nextport in the port of Antwerp, which is a seaport, very similar as an airport. The people from Antwerp, they won't like it if I say it, but in, in essence, the processes are more or less the same. It's called different, uh, the messages are different, the data structures are different, but in the end, it's the, it's, it's the same concept. We've been doing similar things in the chemical industry. We've been doing sim similar things in fast moving consumer goods. Um, but we have to say that in our cargo, that's where we are the, the furthest or the farthest uh, ahead uh, because, of, because of adoption. But we won't stop there. Once, once there are enough airports in, uh, in air cargo uh, that are hooked up to the system so that it becomes almost automatically, we'll, we'll be shifting our focus or, or take on additional focus uh, to those other product market combinations where we have put this in, in, in place and drive this uh, forward. You saw that you saw that uh, our mission is to make the world operate as one. We're currently tackling that community by community, but in the end, we really want the whole world to operate as one. Yeah. I saw a question uh, in the chat box. Uh, one of the questions was: Has no stakeholders stopped uh, uh, with slot booking due to uh, uh, COVID-19 because of financial reasons and uh, so far, none of the stakeholders have indicated that they do not want to use this uh, the application anymore. Uh, in fact, slot booking application is now uh, the tool that really helps them through, uh, through the crisis, because because there is some uh, technical unemployment at uh, the ground handling agent, uh, capacity management is is a bit less. So now with slot booking application. Uh, there is a really structured way they really get their time slot at the ground handling agent uh, where they can pick up or handle the freight so it's it's actually more the go-to tool right right now than uh than saying from hey because of financial reasons i cannot use this application anymore no it's it's really giving them a benefit in this crisis actually yeah and if you look to what you presented uh before uh david uh, the business case can be made pretty easily if you see how many minutes yeah. they save uh, per slot of course. um you see that it's pretty easy for them to calculate that yeah. it's way more um it, it has sorry way more advantages to book a slot uh, and to pay a very small price per slot uh, and eliminate the waiting times than to just go without mm -hmm. any slot booking so there's still a positive business case yeah. for them there is a drop in the number of book slots of course because of the, there is less flights uh, in Brussels, but uh, no one has, has told us or has indicated to to want to get out of the project. Um, there also was a question about how do you influence players that don't want to join uh, the platform? Um, there are different incentives. First of all, it's the advantages, what David already explained. It should be a no-brainer that stakeholders who use slot booking and the other uh, land site management applications in a correct way that they have a clear advantage over the other ones who are not using this. Uh, so that's the first trigger, of course. Um, the other part is we develop the land site management applications um, further and further to make sure that a 100% coverage is um, the standard way to go. So as I mentioned already before, um, the applications we will develop later this year will make sure that everyone who arrives at the handler will be guided easily through a process where they say, hi, I have a slot and I register myself or option B, I didn't have a slot in advance, but I know that the handler has offered all his capacity in slot booking application. And I can here have a view on which capacity is still available within the next hours. And I will make a slot reservation now when I show up here without one in advance. These companies will also be, uh, can be identified from this moment on and we'll also see that when they show up without a reservation in advance their advantage is way uh, lower than the ones who have booked a slot in advance because they show up and it can be possible that they need to wait three maybe four hours because there's no capacity available earlier um, so that's uh, those are the main triggers is first of all making sure that the ones who use the applications correctly the added value and then for the ones who are very hard to identify the the, yeah, the laggards to say so uh, we are now introducing tools which make it necessary for everyone to go through this registration reg, registration process and to make sure that the ground handlers who are all on board at this moment can at least uh, achieve 
yeah, the main part of their advantages, which is managing all their gates and all their personnel via slot booking application. Um, I and still see some questions on, on priority and who is go getting priority first, is the first yeah, served, yeah, yeah. first come first served <laughs> and uh, and as the one that is uh, coming last will be far from his preferred slot. Um, um, so yeah, there we have actually two ways in reserving slot. It's if you book an ad hoc slot, it's of course the one who makes the booking first uh, has a higher chance of finding a match with with this slot uh, request uh, than when everything is already fully booked. At the other side, we also have an incentive for those stakeholders who are very uh, yeah, very good respecting the slots that they have booked. We call it our grandfather rights. And that, that's actually um, where we calculate how uh, much of the slots that they have booked in the past they, um, they used in a correct way. And we have now a percentage of 75%, I think, yeah. uh, David. So if they used the slot in the past, uh, in a correct way for at least 75%, they have the advantage to renew the same booking for the same slot in the future, the moment that the capacity opens up, uh, actually first before the slot becomes available for other stakeholders. So by doing that, uh, stakeholders who, for example, have used the slot on Monday morning, which is slotted everyone wants around 6.30, for example, if they used it very correct in the past, they can keep on using that slot in the future, which also makes sure that some of the um, main movements become more recurrent uh, over the weeks, which makes it possible for both the forwarder and the ground tender to plan their operations uh, more towards those slots. Yeah, and also we are putting some mechanisms in place to uh, uh, yeah, to look at the priority based on the, uh, on the cargo type. So some general cargo might be less important than, for example, live animals or human remains. Uh, it's not in the system yet, but we are working on that, that if you are transporting live animals, for example, you will get a higher priority and you will get uh, foster help at the gate also when booking a slot via digital desk app, for example. Okay, thank you very much. Um, very enlightening. Um, I think uh, we are almost through our time and I think all the questions that, uh, that we've seen here have been answered. Um, as uh, to conclude, I want to say that we have really um, seen in this project that yeah, we have, ha have had the chance in the, in the Clusters to the Zero project really to, to try out and to showcase that um, building such an application can really work and have had the possibility to prove in practice uh, through the living labs that um, that such a community can be working. And uh, the nice thing to see is, I think, an overall uh, conclusion that we can draw. Um, don't try to start with everyone at once. Don't try to force people that do not want to participate, but really incorporate a coalition of the willing a first group that is really believing in innovation and really want to try out uh, to collaborate in this innovative way. And they will drag along all of the others afterwards because they will see the advantages from the others. So an important one is to communicate about the advantages to everyone um, as soon as you have realized something with your first movers and your first innovative companies that want to jump into into new way of collaborating and a new way of, logis of doing their logistics. So thank you all very much. Thank you for your contributions, uh, Alex, Sarah, and, and Davide. Um, and um, yeah, we are looking forward to uh, to the next uh, clusters to that zero uh, webinars that have still uh, that are still to come. Um, and Arita, I don't know if you want to add something to that there. We don't hear you. Hello, I, don't I think I lost for a second. Were you asking something to me especially? No, no. I was just seeing if there's anything to say still on the next uh, clusters uh, webinars to come. I think they can be found. Yes, on the exactly. I just sent uh, a link to all, to the entire audience in the chat, so you can you can find here the the next webinars. Okay. So okay. we have the next one will be on Thursday will be on animal use on new modular loading units so we will be very happy to welcome you to those webinars as well okay
Thank you all very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye.